Hello and welcome to another special edition of the Don't Make Weird Podcast, where your comedy writing storytelling comedy podcast for the writing community by the writing community. And guys, I'm joined as always with this perfect introduction by Dina Soros. What's up, Dina? Did you forget the intro that we've done for 105 episodes? Listen, when we do like special cover reveals, it gets a little weird. The the timing gets off. I mean, you know what happens? Just like I, I really like your brand new chair. It's not new. <laughs> But so thank you for new, noticing honestly. the dribble. I appreciate it. For the folks that are listening audio only, um, <clears throat> Dina currently spilled alcohol all over her shirt, so she's just not wearing a shirt. Don't tune into YouTube. Don't find out. It's fine. Just like and subscribe. Just this will be a video only release, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we are totally screwed. But you know what doesn't make us screwed, guys? I'm so excited. I finally get to meet one of my favorite Twitter personalities. Our guest today is a Canadian author with a degree in political science. Joining us from Vancouver, BC. You may have seen some of her work in Vamp Cat Mag or Cryer Media, or perhaps in the Ryan Morris edited anthology, More Time. Today, we're excited to reveal the cover artwork for her debut novel, The Dragon and the Butterfly, all about Matilda of Flanders, Queen of England and the Duchess of Normandy, and the powerhouse behind William the Conqueror. Mark your calendars for April 22nd, because that's when Lost Boys Press drops this absolute gem. Joining us in welcoming and wishing her a very happy birthday, Abby Simpson. It is my birthday. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy. I'm excited. So you, out of all the things you could have done on your birthday, you chose hanging out with us. Well, I mean, it's still 10 a.m. where I am. I have a whole day ahead of me. But yes, I really did want to hang out with you guys today. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to, you know, do a lot of things. Yeah, no, that, that, that's perfect. No, that's a very smart and insane thing to do. I mean, our goal <laughs> is to get uh, Sean drunk before noon, and there's no awesome. special occasion. So, Abby, Abby, before we get into this, because I know we're really excited, and, I, and I'm so pumped up to get to see this cover. Haven't gotten to see it at all, because Dina doesn't like to share spoilers with me, even though she has all the power to do this. Which I don't you know, trust you. <laughs> that's fair. That's very fair. So, so what's this feel like? This is your debut. This is the big moment. Like, what's going through with you, in your mind right now? Oh, I'm just, I'm really excited. Like, I mean, it's, it feels a bit like it's been a long time coming, but at the same time, it's like so fresh and so new and it's just a very exciting time. It's nice to be, you know, my age and <laughs> having new experiences <laughs> like this. It's nice to be me. That's what I tell people <laughs> nice all the time. <laughs> I would hate being you, Daniel. Dina, <clears throat> oh, you know, that's just mean. It's it's hurtful, is what that is. But oh, so, I'm sorry. So, Dina, let me ask you to speak on behalf of Mr. Lost Boy himself, um, which I'm pretty sure is the creator of Lost Boys Press. Is this correct? Yes, that's correct. <clears throat> First name <laughs> is Boy. Last name is Lost, yes. though. Yes, absolutely. Um, could you ask Mr. Boy, uh, what was it that attracted your press? to pick up its first historical fiction novel. Did, uh, Abby, did you query it or did we come to you? <laughs> uh, so this is something that, um, I mean, I've known uh, Chad and Ashley for years um, through Twitter. And so this is something that Ashley was aware that I was writing. She had read some of the early chapters and she did want to see the final version that's right it was ready and so i sent her the final version um so it wasn't officially like a query i suppose in the traditional sense of querying um but of course she had to like it so she did <laughs> so it was kind of like you were like set up on a date where like both you guys kind of knew you already liked each other and you just you know wanted to make sure you didn't blow that first impression is that, is that right. kind of a reasonable definitely yeah. absolutely <laughs> All right, well, let's give the folks a little taste of what this book is all about. 1,000 years ago, a noble's daughter came of age in the county of Flanders. Intelligent and ambitious, Maud would rise to become Queen of England at the side of her husband. Driven by love and loyalty, destined to alter the course of history, her life was charmed by faith and circumstance, but not without sacrifice. Abby Simpson's The Dragon and the Butterfly follows Matilda of, Flan of Flanders, wife to William the Conqueror. As she navigates court life, motherhood, and their shared ambition of claiming the English throne. An epic historical saga that sweeps warmly over decades and featuring a cast of dozens. Matilda's world was never before so richly realized. Shall we jump right into the trailer? 
Let's do this. I'm Wait, pumped, man. I want to say oh, something. Oh. Daniel, were you uh-huh. about to say Matilda Flanders because you were thinking of The Simpsons? Mm-hmm. I can neither confirm nor deny this. <laughs> Your mind maps are so easy, bro. Okay, go ahead with the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even need a jingle with, for it. I actually have a tweet about exactly that. Oh, such a cool cover mm-hmm. like that's, that's gonna uh, be one of Dewey those perfect it. what Dewey Harkwick of course he freaking did it I mean he, he did like it. most of the art right he did the maps <laughs> I think he, yeah. he also built he and I worked on building the family trees together so there's trees in it reminds me of Outlander a lot <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. oh my gosh yeah, I, I, it, yeah. it's gonna fit in perfectly with just any of those just like that era of fiction and of even like fantasy books like that's gonna that's gonna look good on people's bookshelves dude i'm telling you mm-hmm. aesthetically pleasing that's that's the goal <laughs> people put it on their bookshelves and then like it <laughs> but put it on yeah. your bookshelf that's number one mostly just put it on your bookshelf <laughs> yeah <laughs> just get to the bookshelf first we can talk about liking it afterward <laughs> exactly that's secondary <laughs> <laughs> So talk to us what went into this cover design, like uh, working with uh, with Dewey on that. Like, how did this like collaboration like work for you? Because this is, you know, you've never gotten to design a cover before. Yeah. So, I mean, essentially, the two elements that we thought had to be on the cover were the dragon and the butterfly, obviously, and the title. <laughs> seems, and, seems, yeah, seems yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I we did kind of want a more simple aesthetic. Um, and. I feel like this accomplishes that. And just originally there was potentially discussion about doing a cover that was reminiscent of the Bayou Tapestry, which is this um, very large tapestry that tells the story of the Norman Conquest um, from a certain point of view. And uh, it just didn't go to plan. It wasn't that. I'm. It just didn't go that way, but that I, I love this, and I love like the simple color, the blue and the yellow. Um, they come back m- multiple times in the story itself, and yeah, that's really that's really it. And then we used a, some kind of um, like artwork on uh, like Cornwell books and other kind of books from the era to sort of get a vibe. If that yeah. makes sense for yeah. our cover. And yeah. I don't really have anything else to add on the cover. No, cover. No, no, so no, what no, made no. you want to write um, <laughs> a book about Matilda of Flanders? <clears throat> uh, I mean, I've always been interested in history and I will kind of get on certain jumping down rabbit holes of research and After so this okay, this is a little serious and I don't know, but after the death of my dad in June 2020, I had um, a complete break from like creativity and I couldn't write anything. I like for months just had no interest in writing creativity, nothing. And then one day I had I'd been watching um, The White Queen which was a series that aired on stars. Um, for me, it was on prime. Um, but that was 
kind of a really inspiring, sorry, story for me, um, just in terms of like taking history we know, but focusing it from perspectives we're not familiar with, right? More feminine perspectives. And so that inspired me. Um, the story of Matilda herself, though, totally inspired me. Um, and there would, my dad had always said to me, he's like, you should really write historical fiction. I think you'd be great at it. And I said, yeah, but I don't know. Like I, cause I'm so a perfectionist when it comes to the research and I don't want to get like facts, like blatantly wrong. Um, obviously with fiction, you play a little bit with history, um, and historical fact, and you want to make it, you know, a little exciting, dress it up a bit, but I, I've always been conscious of like, just overthinking whether or not I could actually do it. But, you know, about three, four months after the death of my dad, it was almost like I, and I, I don't, I'm like, I'm totally atheist, but I'm like, you know, it, like I got like this feeling of like, you should write this book, you can do this. And it was almost like, like my dad was like, like I was coming to terms with some level of my grief, if that makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. And he, my dad was always such a huge supporter of my writing that um, it was, it just sort of felt like I need to start writing this story. And I did. And it took two years to write it. but <laughs> I did it. That's incredible. And, and I'm sure that this is going to be an incredible story and, uh, you know, motivated by or honoring him. Um, and that's incredible. Uh, so let me ask, you, you said that this isn't like your main genre that you write in. What would you say is... is oh, like, no, it is now. <laughs> oh, this is your main genre now. This it is, is now, okay, so yeah. Sorry. This is, this is like, your thing in this now. World, like, I'm never leaving. Pardon? Uh, so that's amazing. So, okay. Is it this time period in general? Or do you see yourself when you're writing future stories kind of hopping uh, into different eras, different cultures? So I'm very, like, methodical and chronological in that sense. And I like the idea of telling a story. Like, I've written already um, the follow-up book to The Dragon and the Butterfly. And I'm just working on finalizing it, like, finishing it off here. And um, hopefully, hopefully Lost Boys wants that, too. So also, we, you know, we want to sell books so that the second one can come out, right? <laughs> we as in me. But yeah. Um, the second book actually focuses on one of Mott's daughters, um, who will like you'll meet her kids in book one, right? But they're a little yeah. older in book two, and so I'm telling, I'm continuing to tell the story of this like very dramatic soap opera family because yeah. <laughs> they are very dramatic, and it's just now from a different point of view and covering a few more, uh, covering the next few decades, if that makes sense. Um, so. What I love is like that this book sort of felt like it was a turning point in European history, for sure. British history, European history. Um, so I liked that it kind of like has a starting point in that respect. But now it also has like a thousand years that I could play with. And I love that. What's the <laughs> timeline that occurs within this book? In this book, it's about 30 years exactly. Give or take like a couple months. <laughs> So, I mean, we definitely have some time jumps as well. Like, I'm not sitting here, you know, every single day. <laughs> not not day-to-day for, day for 30 years. <laughs> but it, it does, like, we meet her when she's um, about eight years old. Mm -hmm. And the story ends when she's about And she 30. opened doorknobs yep. at eight? <laughs> I, I cannot talk without using my hands. I'm so bad. Like, no, if no, I wasn't, no, I'd no, be no, like... No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no, um, <laughs> so a, I wrote a a, when I was when I was still writing nothing special. Mm -hmm. um, Daniel was beta reading it, and Paisley um, was like seven or eight, and like I had her struggling to open a doorknob in a scene, and Daniel you know, was like, no, "Do you know anything about kids? kids?" Right? Like, I mean, <laughs> thank I mean, you, in, thank you. <laughs> A thousand years ago, though, most of the doors were like not really like super hinged. They, you yeah, know, I was gonna say a giant stone door. She might oh, not yeah, have been able to. She might not have been able to. Like, like, yeah. it's, like to lock a door a thousand years ago, I think you needed like an extra piece of wood to sort of like bring over the um <laughs> the, the threshold. I call it a I call yeah. it an architrave now because I heard that word and I love it so much. But the lintel, like the thing that goes around the door, is an architrave. Yeah, and it's one of my favorite words now. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's a good word. I like. It's a great word, right? Sean, write that down. Make it a thing, because in like as uh, one of my betas for book two was like, I I had to look stop and look up this word, so you might want to change it to lintel, and I was like, (sighs) I can't do that. No, keep it. Yeah, my favorite thing, like the the thing with fiction is like. It allows people to learn new things. Like if you're not reading a book and you're not learning at least one new thing from this book, there's no point in it. So if it's there's true. a word that somebody has to look up, let them look it up. Gee. Mm-hmm. So, Sorry. so Dina has just convinced you all not to read Thunderstruck because you will not gain anything from it. That's nope. probably not true. Probably true. Yep. All right. So one last question, then we're going to get you out of here for people who say, hey, I don't read historical fiction. I don't even know what the genre is. History is for uh, dorks. Why should they check out your book? One, dorks are great. Two, yes. <laughs> I've actually, so I've really actually tried to sort of make a more histo- um, more accessible historical fiction novel. And obviously, whether I've succeeded or not is up to the reader. But um, the conversations that they have um, use modern contractions, for example, because I'm just not, I'm not playing with dialogue Jeez, of a thousand and- years ago to the point where it's like, that's it just it's you can't really connect to it and i do obviously have my female main character who has a mind of her own and agency and you know a lot of people would argue that you know women of a thousand years ago maybe didn't have that but they also didn't write their histories a thousand years ago they were writing history not from the perspective of women 90 percent of the time so what I'm really trying to make a heroine that's, you know, mod- well, maybe you wouldn't call her a heroine, but a main character that uh, modern era- uh, audiences can relate to, even though they didn't live a thousand years ago. So I've really tried to do that. And again, like I say, whether the reader thinks that or not is up to them. But um, I did really want to make a historical fiction novel that I would like to read as well, because I do agree that some historical fiction maybe goes a little too hard on descriptions, right? Because they're trying to like put you into that world of a thousand years ago. So they spend like a page describing a scene. And for me, that's always kind of like I end up skimming over a lot of that because I'm like, it doesn't matter to the plot necessarily, <laughs> which so I don't that's know. Awesome. I'm no, trying. So amazing. it's historical I- fiction there's- with modern prose that's easy prose that's easily accessible for people. Yes, thank you for summarizing it without Boom. my like hand movements and like. At, uh, no, the hand movements are amazing. Don't ever let anyone tell you otherwise. We hand gesture here. I talk with my hands all the time, so you're jazz good. hands. But all right, guys, this has been an amazing cover reveal. We cannot wait for this book to get released on April twenty second. Pre orders are opening in February. Uh, man, you can check out everything from Lost Boys Press on all their social medias on Twitter, on Threads, on. Um, are you guys on Blue Sky? I'm assuming you're on Blue Sky. Instagram. I think so. TikTok. We're on, we're on everything. Substack. Subscribe to our Substack. There's a lot of cool stuff coming there. Yeah, I, ru- I run a really spicy Lost Boys Press Snapchat. You know, it's fine. No, he doesn't. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, no, not at all. All right. No. So we can't wait for you guys to check this out. This cover is amazing. Abby, tell the folks where they can Looks find so you. so good Sean. Abby, tell them what? Sorry. Oh, my gosh. Where the folks can find you? Uh, they can find me on Twitter at Abby the Tweet, uh, Instagram and Threads at Abby the Graham, uh, TikTok at Abby the Tick. Um, yeah, I tried to do you know something kind of, but like once I started with Abby the Tweet, I couldn't just use the same username across all platforms. So yeah, right. I pitched myself I'm into so that. Jealous. <laughs> That's cute though. That's a good idea. Dina, do you like my steal this idea? Yeah, no, it like it's too late. Yes, too it's late. too late. No, you Use can't. Use your Twitter yeah. handle in 150 recordings. Every episode. You cannot change it now. Sean, I'm going to need you to go back and edit all, all of our uh, previous. No. I'll just delete it all, burn it to the ground. <laughs> well, this has been <laughs> probably the final episode of Don't Make It Weird, guys. Check out The Dragon and the Butterfly. Check out Abby online. Until next time, y'all. 